Well, I have a love-hate relationship with exercise. I played, <laughs> thank you, I played soccer for half my life. I played soccer from the age of four all the way through college. I understand the importance of daily exercise, not because my doctor tells me uh, that I should or that health magazines have cool new workouts or I see all the gyms around my house for things like climbing and CrossFit and cycling and circuit training. I know that exercise is important for my overall health, physically and mentally. I know this because I managed to study it in school. So being a college athlete and having a kinesiology, a kin I can't even say it, kinesiology degree should have set me up nicely for a healthy adulthood with a love for being physically active. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. I was the worst right out of college. I never wanted to run, lift weights, or put on a pair of cleats again. There's something else you should know about me. I am a team player. I will show up and cheer on my teammates. I never want to let anybody down. I love the accountability that comes with being on a team. However, left to my own devices, I will sleep in, forego a walk, the air on my tires will go flat, and I will make up any excuse I can think of to pass on physical activity. The list includes things like laundry, and reading, and cleaning, and baking, and going to the, dis <laughs> going to the dentist, you name it. I'll run errands all day, it doesn't matter. There is something that I know to be true, though, that if I agree to do something and someone is going to be waiting for me to show up, I am there. I will do it. For the last year, I have gone on a walk every morning. I don't do this alone. I'm accompanied by my walking buddy, by someone who I know is waiting for me every morning at 6.30. To hit the streets of the east side and walk towards and on the river walk and then back home again. Every morning when my alarm goes off, I want to continue sleeping. But knowing that someone is waiting for me, someone is expecting me to get out of bed and put on my tennis shoes is enough to not hit the snooze button for the second time. It turns out I don't need an entire team of women expecting me to show up for a morning practice on a soccer field or a gym filled with, filled with people ready to max out. I just need one person who has agreed that this is the thing that we are going to do every morning. And not being alone is enough. Enough to do the thing that we both know is important for our health, physically and mentally. The one person is enough of an encouragement and a reminder that we have committed ourselves to this part of the day and this is set aside for this particular activity. I imagine Jesus knew a thing or two about team formation, team dynamics, and accountability. Jesus knew this when he appointed the 70 to go out to proclaim the kingdom of God. He put them in pairs. He partnered them up and said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go out and tell to all the places that I intend to go, I'm sending you ahead of me to tell people that the kingdom of God is near. When we're given a directive or marching orders, a specific task, regardless if, if it's something that we're over the moon about, excited, or we're kind of just compliant, or we're dreading what is next. I think we all can agree it's nice to have someone with you. Someone on the same journey, perhaps, or just someone who is there with you, present to the task at hand. Jesus sends this group of followers out two by two for this reason. He knew that whatever they were going to be up against, they were going to be able to get through it with a partner, someone who could hold them accountable each step of the way. The task was a little crazy. There was a clear instructions, but not the best itinerary. Go here, stay with whoever will take you in, eat whatever they offer you. Also, don't take anything with you. No need for a purse or clothes or shoes. And whatever you do, don't talk to anyone you meet on the road. That doesn't add up. I don't know about you, but I over-prepare for road trips. I plan with enough time for incidentals. I pack snacks and drinks for everyone. I have an idea about where we will stop to eat. I know where we are staying, and if it's with friends, they know we are coming. The car has been washed, the oil has been changed, and the tires have been checked. We're ready to go. I know not everyone is like this, and I imagine people like me drive some of you crazy, and that's okay. It takes all kinds to go on a road trip together. 
you know this. These followers were told that when they go, when, when they get to where they're going, to whoever will let you into their home first, first say, peace to this house, then eat what is set before you, and cure the sick, and when you've done all of this, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So what does it mean to proclaim peace? And what does it mean to proclaim the kingdom of God has come near? And why, as followers of Jesus, is this something we're called to do? Stanley Harris, a theologian, says this about practice and peace. He says, Patience with hope will indeed be the virtues needed to grow up into the reality of a community witnessing to the peaceable kingdom. The peace that we can know with ourselves is the, is the fruit of forgiving others and shedding our illusions. Since that description could hardly characterize the world in which we live, it must depict the community we would form in the likeness of the kingdom Jesus preached and embodied. I believe this is important that we understand the difference between rules and practice. This is less of a rule and more of practice, a thing in which we should embody, a practice that forms and shapes us in ways that rules cannot. At the root of what Stanley is talking about is virtue theory, right? Our ability as humans to possess virtues and practice them in ways that shape our character. To be people of peace, to be people who are capable of going out into the world with no itinerary, with nothing but the clothes on our backs and the person walking next to us, requires us to be the kind of people who are willing to bear one another's burdens, who are capable of forgiveness rooted in a deep sense of community. When we say the kingdom of God has come near, what we are saying is Jesus' reign is close. It's here but not yet. It is near to you. It is near to us. Jesus' kingdom of peace is near. The war the world has been engaged in is no more. And there is one true king now, one king that is reigning, and that kingdom is marked by peace marked by forgiveness, marked by bearing one another's burdens, marked by kingdom people loving their neighbors, all of their neighbors. The peace for which we hunger and thirst is determined and made possible only through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Those that were sent out to share about God's kingdom, they were not offering people a new religious option which might have a gentle effect on their lives. They were offering a new way, a way of peace. God's kingdom, God's sovereign and saving rule, longing to enfold God's people and the whole world with love and new creation had come close to them. This is what has come close. This is what we are called to proclaim. In the middle of our gospel reading this morning, there's this interesting little bit that Jesus has to offer those that he is sending out, and he offers to us. Jesus tells them, if you ever enter a town and no one welcomes you there, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I think we all can agree it's a bit dramatic to be wiping the dust off your feet in the middle of a street, right? I'm sure there's other ways to leave a place that you're not welcome that doesn't draw on your theatrical abilities. The part that is most important here is that regardless of whether these followers of Jesus were welcomed in a town, the task at hand is still the same. Tell the people who reject you the same thing that you tell the people who fed you and those you cured. The kingdom of God has come near. Tell them the same thing because it's true. The kingdom of God has come near to everyone, to those who believe and to those who don't, to those who welcomed you and to those who cast you away, to those who have many burdens and to those who are helping to bear those burdens, to all people, to the whole world, the kingdom has come near. Jesus calls us two by two to go out into the world to proclaim peace 
and the kingdom of God has come near. And Jesus calls us two by two to remind us that we are not alone, to give us a partner in this kingdom work, the work of proclaiming to a world that desperately needs to hear it, that God has enfolded the whole world into God's love, that the kingdom is reigning, the kingdom that is here and not yet, the world that is broken, violent, and filled with injustices is not the world that kingdom people inhabit. The kingdom of God that has come near is one that is marked by love and peace and justice. A kingdom where neighborly love is exalted and practicing and living out virtues of peace is more common than talk in a Miss America pageant. My hope for you is if you don't have someone who gets you out of bed each morning and holds you accountable to the things you have committed to in this life, to be clear, I'm not talking about exercise, find someone, look around, they might be sitting next to you. My prayer for us is that we are people of peace, who become more rooted in this way of life, that we form a community of deep friendships that are marked by the likeness of the kingdom that Jesus preached and embodied. May we in our goings and comings be only able to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near in peace, knowing from our own understanding, experience, and truth that Jesus is king and his kingdom is not of this world. Amen.